Jacob adopted them. This is why he got a bigger portion. Jacob adopted them as his own, placing them on an equality with his own sons. And they became progenitors, a big word to say the fellow that provided the offspring spring for the separate tribes. So that's why there were two. Many, most of the resources I saw in researching this implied there were other sons. But this pretty much said there were two sons. I'm not sure which is right, because I, I never saw any other names, but I didn't see enough to convince me that that wasn't the case. But Manasseh was the oldest son, but did not get the major blessing, and that's what we're getting to now. Jacob adopted them and placed them on equality with his sons, and when he blessed the two boys, Jacob subordinated Manasseh, the eldest, to Ephraim, the younger. Does that sound familiar to anybody? It's not his first time in doing that. Now, he did it by through the deceit of Jacob and trickery, but Jacob, the younger son, was subordinate to Esau, the oldest son, because of what went on there. So Jacob basically did the same thing again. But he also blessed Manasseh, and he, and he blessed him with this. He blessed them by the angel who has redeemed Jacob from all evil and was to become a great people. Jacob's statement, by you, Israel, will pronounce blessings, saying, God makes you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And that is uh, the basis of a benediction in Jewish, that Jewish parents pronounce over their sons on the Sabbath and on holy days. So that blessing is still, that was placed on these two sons, or grandsons, that were adopted as full sons over time. Uh, Manasseh's Aramean concubine was the mother of Machir, and we're going to look at him because we're, we're going, whoops, I think I actually missed reading our first verse, or I got my new notes out of order, but we'll get to that. All right. The concubine was the mother of Machir whose descendants became the tribe of Manasseh. So it was one son of Manasseh who was, there were many and there were plenty of tri tribal offshoots that we're going to see, but he is the primary uh, one descended from on that side. And uh, allegedly he acted as the interpreter in the house of Joseph when the brothers came to visit. So when Joseph was in conversation with his brothers, he was actually an interpreter there. The language wasn't as strong as we would assume from Joseph there. And that also comes from Jewish tradition. That's not biblically take it and, and die for it. But Jewish tradition says and he, that this grandson was the primary recipient of the inheritance of Manasseh. And he was very smart and very physically strong. All right, let's go ahead and read chapter 17, starting with verse 1. And that's what I'm going to stop with and chat about that, but we're not doing that on every verse. There was also a lot for the tribe of Manasseh, for he was the firstborn of Joseph, namely for Machir, the firstborn of Manasseh, the father of Gilead, because he was a man of war. Therefore, he was given Gilead and Bashan. All right, there's a bunch of verses about Machir, which is not a na name I remembered immediately. I know I've read it dozens of times, but he's in there a lot. And you actually see probably more of him mentioned in the Bible than you see Manasseh. Uh, Genesis 50:23. And we'll read a few of them. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were brought up upon Joseph's knees. 
so close family tie there. Numbers 26, 29. Of the sons of Manasseh, of Machir, the family of the Mechorites, and Machir begot Gilead, and Gilead co comes from, from the family of the Gileadites. Whew. Reading numbers can be fun. 27, 1. We're going to do it again. Then came the daughters, Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, of the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, and these are the names of his daughters, Mala, Noah, Hoglah, and Milcah, and Tirzah. Numbers 32, 39. And the children of Machir, the son of Manasseh, went to Gilead and took it, and dispossessed the Amorite which was in it. Numbers 32, 40. And Moses gave Gilead unto Machir, the son of Manasseh, and he dwelt therein. So we actually hear mostly about Manasseh as being the father of Machir in the Bible. Let's continue reading with verse 2, <clears throat> and all the way to the end. And there was a lot for the rest of the children of Manasseh according to their families. For the children of Abiezar, the children of Helek, the children of Asriel, the children of Shechem, the children of Hefer, and the children of Shemadah, these were the male children of Manasseh. And there we go, they are in there. So that reference was wrong. The son of Joseph according to their families. But Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, had no sons but only daughters. And these are the names of his daughters, Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milcah, and Tirzah. And they came near before Eleazar the priest, before Joshua the son of Nun, and before the rulers, saying, The Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance among our brothers. Therefore, according to the commandment of the Lord, he gave them an inheritance among their father's brothers. An unusual thing, but God said do it, and they were obedient. Verse 5, Ten shares fell to Manasseh, besides the land of Gilead and Bashan, which were on the other side of the Jordan. Because the daughters of Manasseh received an inheritance among his sons, and the rest of Manasseh's sons had the land of Gilead. And the territory of Manasseh was from Asher to Michmathoth, that lies east of Shechem, and the border went along south of the inhabitants of En Tapua. Manasseh had the land of Tapua, but Tapua on the border of Manasseh belonged to the children of Ephraim. And the border descended to the brook Cana, southward to the brook. These cities of Ephraim are among the cities of Manasseh. The border of Manasseh was on the north side of the brook, and it ended at the sea. Again, we talked about these guys making it to the sea, and both said they did, even though the maps aren't necessarily going to show you that. Southward, it was Ephraim's. Northward, it was Manasseh's. And the sea was its border. Manasseh territory was adjoining Asher on the north and Issachar on the east. And in Issachar and in Asher, Manasseh had Beit Shean and its towns, Ibleam and its towns, the inhabitants of Dor and its towns, the inhabitants of Endor, sounds like we're reading Tolkien there, and its towns, and the inhabitants of Ta'anach and its towns, and the inhabitants of Mehido and its towns, three hilly regions. Verse 12, yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites were determined to dwell in that land. And it happened when the children of Israel grew strong that they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not, did not utterly drive them out. Then the children of Joseph spoke to Joshua, saying, We have you give why, oh, excuse me, why have you given us only one lot and one share to inherit, since we are a great people, inasmuch as the Lord has blessed us until now? So Joshua answered them, If you are a great people, he sounds pretty sarcastic here to me. If you are a great people, then go up to the forest country and clear a place for yourself there and in the land of the Perizzites and the giants, since the mountain of Ephraim are too confining the mountains of Ephraim are too confining for you. 
But the children of Joseph said, The mountain country is not enough for us, and all the Canaanites who dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron, both those who are of Beit Shean and its towns, and those who are of the valley of Jezreel. And Joshua spoke to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, saying, You are a great people, and have great power. You shall not have only one lot, but the mountain country shall be yours. Although it is wooded, you shall cut it down, and its furthest extent shall be yours. For you shall drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots and are strong. After the initial sarcasm, it did sound sort of like he was encouraging them. But that's the way I read it. You may read it differently. Okay, the tribe of Manasseh was closely associated with Ephraim and with the tribe of Benjamin during the wanderings in the wilderness and afterwards. And basically, these are all the descendants of Israel, or Jacob, by Rachel. They hung together for good and for bad. They encamped on the west side of the tabernacle. All the different tribes were in different locations, and those guys had the west. According to the census at Sinai, the tribe numbered around 32,200 men. And 40 years later, its numbers had increased to 52,700 warriors. And it was at this time probably the most distinguished of all the tribes, certainly in combination with their Ephraim. They were the predominant tribe, if you look at it as Joseph's tribe. All right, back to the map. No, I didn't get one. But I gave, every, everybody's got a map. I don't think anybody else came in. And I'm going to hold it up and kind of point things out. The Ephraim we looked at last week, and I'm pretty convinced from my reading it did make it to the ocean rather than, or to the Mediterranean Sea, rather than being cut off there. Benjamin, right below it, which includes Jerusalem. Manasseh is, we got the two half-tribes of Manasseh. So Manasseh is a half-tribe of Jacob, but it was also broken up into the sides. With the, and we'll read a little more about that here shortly. But we've got Manasseh here, and then we've got a big chunk of Manasseh here. And if you remember the other map, which I didn't give you a copy of, Everything in this area is what today is called the Golan Heights. And you actually get up almost to Damascus was part of the territory of Manasseh. And if you look at it, there's considerable amount of land for those folks. All right. Now, the half-tribe of Manasseh along with Reuben and Gad, had their territory assigned by Moses on the east side of the Jordan. That's this side of the map, these three. And this territory on the east side of the Jordan, if you remember as we're coming into the land, they said, we like it right here, this is fine. It really was some of the most productive, best land that was available in that area at that time. So they picked well as far as getting good land, not so much for being defensible. And it was more valuable, and to a large extent, what these tribes, Gad, Reuben, Manasseh, Ephraim, and to a lesser extent, Benjamin, got the vast majority of the best land available to all of the Israelites. The portion given to the half-tribe of Manasseh was the largest on the east side of the Jordan. It was also the largest of, outside of Judah on the west side of the Jordan. So they got a fair chunk of land. They, it embraced the whole land of Bashan, which was a large part of who they were driving out, 
It was bounded on the south by Mahanaim, and it extorted, ext extorted, extended north to the foot of Leb Lebanon. It was a big, bigger chunk than Israel has, which is the back side of the map today. If you look, they extended into both Syria, Lebanon, and where it actually went, also went down into what's Egypt. And anytime somebody's saying that, you know, this whole area is Palestine, no, this little area here would qualify as being Palestine or Philistia based on the Philistines. That was the area they lived in. Well, they did not have all of the land that the Jews have had then or have now. The, and it was sort of in this text. He said, because we're bigger and we're stronger and we need more room. And it was given to them, which kind of gets to what we'll be covering shortly is our context of fairness. Okay, the whole land of Gilead was conquered. Then the two and a half tribes that were on the east bank uh, and you'll hear a lot of references to that area today, but those two and a half tribes left their wives, their families back in the fortified cities, went and fought for the rest of the land for Israel, and then went back. And when the allotment of all the land had been completed, Joshua dismissed the two and a half tribes, commending them for their heroic service. And we'll see that later when we get to Joshua 22. Hopefully I didn't mess up anybody's teaching there. But once they were dismissed, they returned back over the Jordan and took their inheritance. On the west of the Jordan, the other half of the tribe of Manasseh was associated closely with Ephraim, probably closer than with their other Manasseh half-tribe as they interacted considerably. And they had their portion in the very center of Israel. It's an area of about 1,300 square miles. And it is then, and even to a large extent now, the most valuable land. It has springs of water, a good thing to have when you're basically in a desert environment. And if you go back to this, everything south of West Bank is pretty much desert. I mean, Israel has more land, or at least as much land as they used to have, but it's not, this land is virtually unproductive where this was a very productive area. So, and that is the bread back basket of Syria and Jordan used to be part of Israel's land there. All righty. They, like I said, they had plenty of water, which was a very good thing there. Manasseh's portion was immediately to the north of that of Ephraim, which we looked at last year, and it last year, last week, and was actually larger than the half-tribe of Ephraim got. So the western Manasseh ended up defending passes that were very important, and then on the eastern side, they also had passes that were very important. Like I said, it was very mountainous up where, on the, this side, where it does label it the Golan Heights. And if you remember the one map we had, it showed a, a ring of mountains there. And to the north also, it was quite mountainous. All right, now my, how are we doing? We're going, well, I ran you over last time, we're gonna let you, loose early this time. But my teaching is gonna be fairly brief and the history was a big focus. But I want you to look at, and what I have said a few times, the fairness of this situation. How come they got so much more? Well, one thing, they asked for it. And, but they had to earn it. And they did have, they got a good straw right off the bat, but then they got more because of the promises that were made to Joseph's 
offspring. So ultimately, the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim received almost half of the total conquered area that Joshua took possession of under God's divine leadership. And not only was it the largest share, it was among the very best of the land, both east and west of the Jordan. And history reveals they were not the best stewards. We'll see that some of that later in this study. Uh, they were leading the tribes of Israel into the breakup of the kingdom, and they continue to leave. And if you remember the histories of the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom, the northern kingdom had no good kings, and the majority of them came from these two tribes. So not a good track record there. And our tendency, particularly as Americans, but it's more prevalent in our culture than just here, though you see it best here, is our dwelling on the concept of fairness. I hear it from adults all the time. I heard it from children all the time. Anybody else ever hear, well, that's not fair very often? Uh, you, you probably did from two supposed adults. You know, that this, you know, you gotta do things for me. This concept is actually, there's not really a word for our equivalent of fairness in Hebrew. The closest thing they've got is justice, but that has a fairly different twist to being fair. So our concept of fairness really wasn't something you could have described to an ancient Hebrew. I think they have put a word in modern Hebrew that's equivalent of it, but in ancient Hebrew, it didn't exist. The land lottery would have not seemed unjust to them in this time. It was, this is God's decision, is how they would have looked at that. Not the, oh, he got the good straw, which is how we would look at it. Well, okay, this is how I would look at it. I'm including you in my sinful nature. If you don't, it doesn't apply to you, ignore that. But, you know, it's a, oh dang, I didn't win the lottery this week again, but I deserve it. That concept is as old as man, but it was not acceptable in the society of that time. It was a sin. Um, so the land lottery would have been okay with everybody. The complaint of needing more land that we do see in verse 14 really to me sounded greedy. So we already got this great track, but it was a real need. And Joshua addressed it by, as I said, maybe sarcastically, but definitely encouraging them. If you need more land, go take it, earn it. Here's a pretty good concept. I didn't make it a life lesson, but you know, if your kids want money, have them earn it. Say, yeah, you can have money. Go out and mow the lawn. Pick up sticks. Stick, pick up sticks so I can mow it. I, my best, probably the, well, the second best day of work I've ever had in my life was when I was 14 and I mowed 20 something lawns on a Saturday. I mean, for the money that I earned then, comparing it to how I've done every day since then, that was. Number two, I did ha have one that was better than that, but that was doing something for a lawyer, so they got a lot of money to throw around. So, <laughs> when it's, it's a whole lot, as the government shows us, it's a whole lot easier to spend somebody else's money than your own. All right. So, we look at that and we see it is greedy, and maybe it was, but it was a need and it was addressed. And we want to be very careful and when we're desiring fairness, when we're pursuing that, especially if we're applying it to ourselves. Now, I'm much more likely to want things to be fair for you guys. At least I tell myself that. But when they aren't fair for me, I whine. And that is 
a real slippery slope heading towards violating the Tenth Commandment. Anybody know the Tenth Commandment? You can probably figure it out from the way I've been talking, but maybe not. And that's thou shalt not covet. And it lists a whole bunch of things. But it is a very broad category in the Bible, and it's really broader in our lives. And it is a, like I said, it is a slippery slope that we can step on in righteousness and go down fast. The, our society, unfortunately, is all about getting more, getting better, you know, getting, getting, getting. I see it all around us. And psychology has sort of set up the trap there. Anybody familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs? How many of those are really needs? Most of them are wants. It's, there are things that God wants us to have. And he's not going to distribute them evenly. In this room, we have people that have very little, people that have much. But you're all here. You're all brothers. God is distributed separately and differently. And when we get into the place of, you know, it isn't fair. I, I deserve to make as much money as Joel. You, you make a pun, don't you? I could, I could fairly easily say that, you know, most of you are probably doing as well as Nick and I because we work in ministry, not a well-paid profession. But it doesn't. That, for, for, some, for some, it doesn't. Uh, but that is a goal we end up setting, and we call it a need, but it isn't a need. Um, and one of the scariest things is, is there can be very good reasons to want things to be fair, to want things to be equitable. That's not in itself an evil, but it's very easy for that to turn into something that is wrong. And in our society, it's all the more so. So we first need to look at our desires, and God gives us desires, and our needs. Is there anybody here that can honestly say you don't have what you need? Is there anybody here that can honestly say, I don't want something else. Okay. That's our life. And that is a place that leads me to the two nice short life lessons that I want you to take out of here. The first one, if you don't have it, you don't need it at least not now. If you don't have it, you don't need it now. And if and when you do need it, God will provide it. Need, not want. But if you need it, you have it. And that kind of lead, and that really can be anything. It can be money, it can be love. Right now I feel like I need some rest, but I really don't, I've had all the rest I needed. I may have been a little more addled than I would have normally been, but it also led me to discover some things. So I have what I need, even when it comes to things like that. And we don't usually think of that. I mean, we, most of our needs we define with money because most of what we think we need is stuff. And that's one of many things that may be a need, but you're gonna have what you need. So again, if you don't have it, you don't need it now, and if and when you do need it, God will provide it. Which kind of leads into the one that, and to be perfectly honest, it's something I've been struggling with all week, which is why you're hearing about it. Um, most preachers are gonna do one of two things. When they're preaching about a particular topic, you can either count on the fact 
that they've been hurt by somebody that is going after that topic or they're deep in that sin themselves. That is very common and that's what you're getting tonight. I'm struggling with this at the moment. And two is where God sort of took me with my lost zip drive, which I really needed to do this tonight. Did I? No, I'm still here. But that's how I felt two hours ago when I realized it was missing. But the second one is be content with what you have and with your situation. Our peace, joy, and love is only manifested in a state of contentment. If you have not looked at what Paul said, you know, I found I can be content, and he was in some pretty rough spots none of us have had to deal with. But I've learned how to be content, and that's it. We've got to learn how to be content. And when you are, you will have peace and joy. And you'll experience those in a much greater way if you're not letting your wants become your needs.